Um, so next up is Valerie Libby with the North American Pop Potter Association. She's going to talk about the basics of growing corn pots. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining me here today this afternoon. Like Carrie said, my name is Valerie Libby uh, with Libby Farm. I live in Columbus, but my family has a farm in Washington Courthouse, Ohio, which is halfway between Columbus and Cincinnati off of I-71. And this year we're celebrating uh, becoming a century farm, and that's where I've been growing my pawpaws. And so I'm also with North American Pawpaw Growers Association. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that was established in 2000, and we're committed to raising awareness of pawpaws, educating consumers, and supporting backyard and professional growers. And for today's agenda, I'm going to be covering some basics on background, food safety, and identification. I'm going to be doing a little bit of a deep dive on history because I feel like that's what really makes pawpaws so special compared to other native plants and fruits. And I'll also be providing a lot of details on cultivars, resources, and insider growing tips and tricks. And so way down yonder in the pawpaw paw patch is a traditional folk song that I think many people in the room have probably heard. It really hit the mainstream in America in 1963 when Burl Ives released this album. But what's funny is that I've met so many people who know that song and all the lyrics and still have no idea what a pawpaw is. But uh, pawpaws are actually very special to the state of Ohio. It's our official state native fruit. It was adopted in January of 2009 when Governor Ted Strickland uh, signed Senate Bill 243. And the original native range for pawpaws uh, stretches from northern Florida up to the southern edge of Canada. And you can successfully grow pawpaws in USDA growing zones five through eight. But growers are really stretching those boundaries now, especially in more recent years. Uh, in order for pawpaws to thrive, though, and produce fruit, you really need two conditions, and that's a hot, humid summer and a dormancy period of at least 400 chill hours, uh, which makes it perfect uh, to grow in the Midwest. And so every year, especially during peak season, uh, there's a lot of fake news about pawpaws, and I just want to spend a minute <laughs> providing a PSA uh, on food safety. And as always, you know, make sure you're following the FDA uh, safe food guidelines when you're handling fresh produce. And when it comes to pawpaws, you don't want to eat the skin, not because it's harmful to you, but it is bitter and has kind of an unpleasant texture. But you do want to be careful not to consume any leaves or bark. And some examples are people who like to make herbal teas or tinctures. You want to avoid that because uh, pawpaw leaves, twigs, and bark all contain a natural pesticide called acetogenins. Uh, you also don't want to eat any unripe fruit. And when you're processing the pulp, uh, you want to be careful not to um, get any seed material. Uh, so be careful when you're using a blender or a food processor. But more importantly, you don't want to dehydrate the fruit. Um, what's interesting is that Native Americans were able to create dried pawpaw cakes. Um, back in the day, and uh, unfortunately, those techniques and recipes have been lost to history, but if you use a modern food dehydrator, um, it will cause serious stomach distress with symptoms like sim similar to food poisoning, and anecdotally, it has been known to send people to the emergency room, so you want to avoid dehydrating the fruit at high temperatures. And then for any foragers out there, as tempting as it may be, you don't want to um, eat any fruit that's been punctured or damaged by critters. And so pawpaws are often overlooked um, as a native landscaping tree, but uh, they're really great to have. Uh, pawpaws have been recognized by the Ohio Nursery and Landscape Association 
and don't believe the rumors about the flowers giving off strong offensive odors. In my experience, you really have to stick your nose into the flowers and if anything, I just pick up a very faint yeasty smell. So don't let that prevent you from uh, planting pawpaws in your front yard or your backyard. Can I ask a question? How, about how old are those trees right there? Uh, that I'm not sure about. Uh, they would be, um, my guess would be at least eight to ten years old. So, in this picture. And out in the woodlands, pawpaws are often misidentified, but you can recognize them uh, by their large tropical looking leaves that range anywhere from 6 to 12 inches long and they sit in an alternating pattern on the branches. And my pro tip for you is to download the iNaturalist app. Uh, it's a free app that was created in collaboration with the National Geographic Society and the California Academy of Sciences. And basically it crowdsources information for plants and wildlife. So if you're looking for pawpaw patches, the answer is probably right there on your phone. But for me, the easiest way to scout for pawpaws is in the fall uh, because they turn this brilliant yellow color. So you should mark your calendars for fall equinox as a reminder. And at least in central Ohio, all the tree, uh, trees tend to turn completely yellow sometime in early to mid-October. And so even though it's technically considered a pest, we think of the zebra swallowtail butterfly as our friend. And so pawpaws are the exclusive host plant uh, for the larva. Uh, the zebra swallowtail butterflies are native to the eastern U.S. and southeastern Canada. And you can usually find them in late March to August in the northern part of their range. And uh, they, the butterflies lay their eggs on pawpaw leaves. And what's interesting is that there are folks out there who will grow pawpaws not for native landscaping and not even for the fruit, but specifically to save this endangered butterfly. And like I mentioned, um, the larvae feed exclusively on pawpaws. And um, even though the leaves contain the acetogenins that I mentioned were natural pesticides, the caterpillars can safely consume those, and it actually acts as a chemical protectant against predators like birds. Uh, what I will say, though, is that the caterpillars can do some pretty bad damage to young saplings. So if you find them on a young or vulnerable tree, you can just kind of gently rehome those caterpillars to a larger tree that has young, green, tender leaves. So pawpaw flowers um, or blossoms aren't pollinated by bees, but they're pollinated by flies, beetles, and other insects. And the flowers are considered perfect in that they have both the female and male reproductive structures. And here you can see the female stage of the blossom with the shiny green stigma in the center of the flower. And as the blossom develops, you can see that the petals start turning a deep maroon color and the anthers turn brown and start shedding pollen during the male stage. And pawpaws, um, for the most part, require cross-pollination from a genetically different pawpaw. And I've had a lot of good luck with ham pollination. And all you need to do is get a very soft, flexible brush, and you can collect the pollen from a male blossom and just gently apply that uh, to the green stigma of a receptive female blossom. And with any luck, you'll get a fruit cluster that looks something like this, usually around the May time frame in central Ohio. So now we're gonna talk a little bit more about pawpaw history. And so pawpaws have a really long and interesting history that goes back to Native Americans and early colonial times. Uh, the first written documentation for pawpaws was in 1541 by an officer who was on the expedition with Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto, and they observed Native Americans um, growing and eating pawpaws in the Mississippi Valley. And if we jump forward in time a little bit, 
John Bartram uh, was a Quaker farmer in Philadelphia. And even though he didn't have any advanced education, um, he was considered the world's greatest natural botanist at the time. And for 38 years, he was carrying on an overseas botanical exchange with an English merchant named Peter Collinson, and part of that exchange included pawpaws. And according to legend, George Washington's favorite dessert was a chilled pawpaw. Uh, Washington actually kept really meticulous records of his farm and we have diary entries where he specifically talks about planting pawpaws, um, usually in the March-April time frame. And if you visit Mount Vernon, which is just 13 miles south of Washington, D.C., or visit the Mount Vernon website, which has really good garden maps, uh, you can still find really extensive pawpaw patches all around the property. And Thomas Jefferson was also a fan. Uh, he was only 26 years old when he started construction on Monticello, and he also kept really detailed records of his farm plantings. And if you visit Monticello, uh, there is a very large pawpaw tree that sits directly behind the house. And he wrote about pawpaws in um, Notes on the State of Virginia, and when he was ministered to France, we know that he sent Paul Paul's seeds to his friends overseas. And Paul Paul's were also the fruit that saved Lewis and Clark. So when the Corps of Discovery, which consisted of over 30 men, um, were coming back from their western expedition and were only about a week away from returning home, they completely ran out of food provisions. And Meriwether Lewis was actually wounded from a hunting accident. But what we do have is William Clark's diary entry from September 18, 1806, where he talks about the men foraging for pawpaws and being thrilled on just subsisting on them until they were able to return home to St. Louis. And this is plate 275 of, um, the, this is the yellow-billed cuckoo by John James Audubon from his famous work, um, Birds of America. But unfortunately, Audubon was not a fan of pawpaws, and we know this because of his diary entries where he talks about the fruit being um, pulpy and insipid. Uh, so somebody gave Audubon a bad pawpaw. Um, and so the lesson here is, uh, when you're introducing new consumers to pawpaws, we have to make sure that we're giving them a piece of good fruit. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but there's also a dark side to pawpaw history, and it kind of the Hatfield and McCoy feud actually culminated in what's called the pawpaw tree incident. Uh, so it started at an election day event in August of 1882. Um, Ellison Hatfield got into a heated argument with three of the McCoy brothers. He was stabbed 28 times and shot in the back. And what's shocking to me is that he actually survived for another 48 hours. Uh, but when he finally died from his wounds, the Hatfield family rounded up the McCoy boys, marched them into the woods, tied them to pawpaw trees, and shot them dead in retaliation. Um, but what's interesting is that the state of Kentucky actually has a historical marker at the site of the execution. Uh, in the Pikeville area, and if you go there today, there's actually a really healthy, thriving pawpaw patch that still exists in the spot. So, and one of my favorite topics is uh, pawpaws in botanical art. So we're gonna jump back in time a little bit. Um, Philip Miller was the chief gardener at the Chelsea Physic Garden um, in London. And he actually revolutionized gardening um, with the publication of the Gardener's Dictionary. And this made botanical information just accessible to the average citizen. And if you remember when I was talking about John Bartram and Peter Collinson, this is where the story comes full circle because Philip Miller was the first Englishman to successfully grow two pawpaw plants from seed. And that's how pawpaws were introduced to Europe. 
And if you've never been to the Dayton Art Institute, I can't recommend it enough. Um, I feel like it's a gem in the state of Ohio. And it's the home to this oil painting, um, Still Black with Paw Paws. It was painted circa 1870 to 1875 by Edward Edmondson, Jr. Um, Edmondson was born in Dayton, Ohio, and was the son of a tanner. Um, he didn't carry on the family business, but he pursued art. And the Dayton Art Institute owns 30 of his pieces, and um, it's really incredible to be able to see this painting in person, and it sits in the American collection if you go to the museum. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about cultivars. So <coughs> cultivars are um, plant varieties that have been um, produced by selective breeding. And in pawpaws, some of the key characteristics that we look for are, of course, really great flavor, a low seed ratio, large size, and hardiness. And here um, you can see an example of um, wild foraged pawpaws. And this um, photo was taken, there was a lady who allowed me to take this photo of um, some fruit. This is from the Cincinnati Nature Center. And you can see, you know, they, wild forage pawpaws tend to be smaller in size. Some of them have a really high seed ratio. And the flavor can be really hit or miss. And I suspect that Audubon probably ate a wild forage pawpaw, and that's probably why he didn't like them. But this is an example of a cultivated pawpaw, and just for reference, that's a photo of my hand. And this pawpaw uh, weighed in at 15.4 ounces, and some of the winners at the Ohio Pawpaw Festival are well over a pound. So how do we produce more of these types of pawpaws? And one answer to that is uh, by grafting. And so when you're grafting, you're essentially creating a clone of the parent plant. And um, you do get to fruit production more quickly. And so if you take really good care of the tree, you can, it can start bearing fruit in three to five years. And it's also much more cost effective. Um, when you think about the market prices of trees right now, um, they range anywhere from $40, and I've seen them as high as $100 or $150. So if you're thinking about planting an orchard, grafting is the way to go. And in order to graft, you do need to collect scion wood from you know, a superior parent plant. And you can collect scion sticks um, in late winter, or you can purchase them from a reputable seller that has access to good cultivars. Um, I think the reasonable range for prices uh, is anywhere from six to twelve dollars. And Kentucky State University has done a lot of research on um, grafting, and they found that the most effective method for grafting pawpaws was whip and tongue, and that had about a 96 or 97 percent success rate. And the next best was top grafting or doing a cleft graft, and that was about 66 to 67 percent successful in their studies. And um, when you're looking for cultivars, so Neil Peterson is the most well known pawpaw breeder, and he really helped with the resurgence in the popularity of pawpaws um, in the last few decades. He tasted his first pawpaw in 1975 when he was working on his master's degree at West Virginia University. Um, he uh, trademarked seven cultivars that are available through licensed nurseries. And you can see by the names, they're all callbacks to the Native American roots of pawpaws. Uh, they include Shenandoah, uh, Susquehanna, which from what I understand is one of his personal favorites, Rappahannock, Allegheny, uh, Potomac, which is really well known for flavor and large size. So if you're looking for a pawpaw, you know, that could potentially weigh over a pound, Potomac has been a winner at past festivals. Uh, Wabash and Tallahatchie. And like I mentioned, uh, Kentucky State University, uh, which is based in Frankfort, Kentucky, they have the only full-time pawpaw research department in the world, and they're also home to the USDA National Clonal um, Germplasm Repository for Pawpaws, 
That was established in 1994. And uh, their pawpaw orchards sit on about 12 acres on their ag campus. And they've also trademarked uh, three cultivars that are available through licensed nurseries. Uh, those include KSU Atwood, which is one of my favorites, <coughs> KSU Benson, and KSU Chappelle, which is well known for its flavor. And then we also have uh, Jerry Lehman uh, from Terre Haute, Indiana. He passed away in 2019, but he was a really well-known and well-respected um, pawpaw and persimmon breeder. Uh, and I'm hard-pressed to think of a festival or event where one of his cultivars didn't win for best flavor or largest size. Um, and some of the names that you might run across from his cultivars include Jerry's Big Girl, Jerry's Delight, Lehman Chiffon, Lehman's Delight, and Maria's Joy. And you can find his cultivars uh, primarily through Clip England at England Orchard and Nursery in McKee, Kentucky. And then there's also what I call heritage cultivars that are pretty readily available in the nursery trade and have you know stood the test of time. And this is what I personally focus on. Um, and you can't go wrong with any of these cultivars. And this is only a select list, but some names that you might run across include Overlease, NC1, Sunflower, Mango, and Pennsylvania Golden. And so, um, in terms of fruit end use, clearly uh, demand is exceeding supply right now, and there are uh, opportunities from a marketing, production, and supply chain standpoint that Ohio State is doing a lot of work on. Um, but when you do have fruit, what do you do with it? And um, so, craft brewers and distillers are doing a lot of interesting work right now um, with pawpaw beers, pawpaw wines, um, mead, and even moonshine. And uh, beer is actually probably the number one end use for pawpaw pulp in the market today. And the first brewer um, to make a pawpaw beer was Jackie O's out of Athens, Ohio with their pawpaw wheat beer. And if you're looking for good recipes, I really recommend this book, The Pocket Pawpaw Cookbook by Sarah Burr. Um, Sarah is a chef and author based out of Marietta, Ohio, and she's also really well known for foraging. And she published this book in 2021, and it has a lot of really good traditional recipes in it, um, but also some that are more on the adventurous side. And one of her favorite recipes is pawpaw banana ketchup. And so, Check this out, you can easily find this on Amazon. So, who's ready for a road trip? I think the best way to get access to either pawpaw fruit and meeting up with other pawpaw growers is attending a festival or event. And if you visit my website, I have a page dedicated to events that have been confirmed for 2024 and also a list of historical events. And so the Ohio Pawpaw Festival is the Super Bowl of all pawpaw events. It's held at Lake Snowden near Albany, Ohio, and it's held over three days, um, and it draws in well over 10,000 people every year. Um, and you can get access to fresh fruit, um, trees, there we go. Um, you can try all kinds of pawpaw beer when you're at the festival, and North American Pawpaw Growers Association uh, always has a tent there, so you can get access to veteran growers and ask them any questions that you have. And they also have presentations going in the tent next door uh, throughout all three days. And this year, uh, the Pawpaw uh, Festival is scheduled for September 13th, 14th, and 15th. So you can follow them on Facebook or Instagram or visit their website and keep tabs on when ticket sales become available. And you can benefit from some early bird discounting if you buy your tickets early. 
but if you're looking for events um, sooner rather than later, um, the North American Paw Paw Girls Association um, is partnering with Ohio State to sponsor um, the Ohio Paw Paw Conference and Trade Show um, on Saturday, May 18th um, at the Wooster Camp campus uh, at the Schistler Conference Center. And we have a really great lineup scheduled. Um, we have two different panels. We have a variety panel that's going to feature Neil Peterson. Um, we're also going to have a marketing and production panel, along with a lot of research associates presenting um, some of the work that they're currently doing. And then also a um, tour of Westview Paw Paw Farm. So, you really get a chance to really visit a, a paw paw orchard. This one in particular is owned by Dr. Lauren Kirchner and his wife Mabel, and they have over 300 trees. And uh, that afternoon at the orchard, um, we're going to be featuring a grafting workshop. So you can learn hands on how you can graft your own paw paws. And I believe everyone should have a copy of their fly, the, of the flyer in front of you. So there's still time to register. The deadline for registration is May 13th. So I hope to see a lot of you there if you have a chance. This is last year's flyer, but uh, Kentucky State University always hosts um, uh, National Paw Paw Day um, at the school. Um, in the morning, they feature formal presentations. They host a lunch that includes different paw paw tastings. Um, and then in the afternoon, um, they offer a, paw, a tour of the paw paw orchards. If you're not able to make it to Frankfort, Kentucky, they will live stream this on YouTube. And uh, you can actually catch archived replays of past um, National Paw Paw Day events if you visit them on YouTube. And another Paw Paw Festival that I've been involved in over the last few years is the West Virginia Paw Paw Festival. This is a great event. It's a little bit more of a drive, but it's held at Core Arboretum right next to the football stadium. And again, this is Neil Peterson's alma mater, and he was a guest speaker there last year. Um, I, I really enjoy this every time I visit. They offer a lot of tastings of pawpaws that are free. This event is actually free to the public, so you can get access to tastings, um, you can purchase fruit um, or trees. My only tip is make sure you get there early uh, if you do go. And you know, in terms of resources, my goal for everyone today is that if you're serious about growing pawpaws, that you walk away from this presentation feeling armed with um, what you need to know to do your own research or a person that you can go to to get more information about pawpaws. And there are actually a lot of good books that are available out in the market that I would recommend. And the first one is Pawpaw in Search of America's Forgotten Fruit by Andrew Moore. This is published in 2017 and Moore is a Pittsburgh-based writer and his book was recognized by the James Beard Foundation. And th this book is more of a history of how pawpaws have made a comeback in modern culture. And it's a travel log. Um, what's great about it is that his chapters each profile some of the living legends within the pawpaw community. And if you go to a pawpaw festival or event, chances are you'll be able to meet some of those folks in person and talk to them. And then in 2019, Michael Judd published For the Love of Pawpaws. Uh, Judd is a specialist in permaculture, and he's the owner of Long Creek Homestead in Frederick, Maryland. And every year, he hosts his own pawpaw festival um, on his property. And then in 2021, Blake Cothran published Pawpaws, The Complete Growing and Marketing Guide. Um, Blake is the owner of Peaceful Heritage Nursery in Stanford, Kentucky, and he really specializes in organic um, growing approaches. This is an all-around great growing book. Um, what really stands out to me, though, is that he has a chapter dedicated to cultivars, and it's, uh, I believe, the most comprehensive list of cultivars that I've seen in print. And it includes um, the history of the cultivar, a taste profile, and where you can potentially find sources. So this is a great book to pick up. 
And you know, like I've mentioned throughout the presentation, Kentucky State University is a great resource. All of their information is available for free to the public. And all you have to do is Google KSU Pawpaw, and that will take you to their um, Pawpaw page. They also have a YouTube channel um, that has a lot of little short clips that are really helpful. Uh, Professor Rob Brannon at Ohio University um, is one of the organizers of the Ohio Paw Paw Festival and he manages the education tent there. Um, and he is a guru on paw paw nutrition and pulp processing. And you can find his PowerPoint presentations online or see his presentations that have been posted to YouTube um, if you search for his name. And then our friends at Ohio State, they actually have two pawpaw orchards. So one um, is at the campus, the Ag Campus in Columbus, right off of Kenny Road. And the other is at OSU South Centers in Piketon, Ohio, which is just 70 miles south of Columbus um, as you're heading down to Portsmouth. Um, they have a dedicated page to pawpaws, and if you visit um, that website, they actually have an archive of a lot of the material from the North American Pawpaw Growers Association available um, for free. So be sure to check that out. The number of Facebook groups over the last few years for pawpaws has just completely exploded. And by my last count, I think at least um, there are 16 available. Um, one that I would definitely highlight to you, though, is Pawpaw Fanatics. Uh, that was created by Neil Peterson. Um, he's one of the admins, and he's on there quite often answering questions directly for the public and um, posting really good information. So I would definitely recommend joining that group if you're on Facebook. Um, another one that I would recommend is Paw Paw Chronicles. It's newer, but it's been growing really quickly, and um, it's a great resource for um, new growers. So I would check that out. So next, I'm going to um, switch gears and um, really dive into growing pawpaws and provide you know some tips and tricks. And we could go down a really deep rabbit hole on this subject, but I'm going to stick to um, the key fundamentals and leave plenty of time at the end for any specific questions that you might have. And so when it comes to pawpaw patches, I think uh, James Dingus from the Pawpaw Chronicles said this best when um, he said you can divide woodland pawpaw patches into two categories. You, uh, some of them are pawpaw communities where there's a lot of genetic diversity or they're clonal patches that are almost all root suckers growing from the same parent plant. And every year when I'm at the Ohio Paw Paw Festival, um, one of the top questions that I get all the time is, you know, hey, I have this woodland paw paw patch, but there's no fruit. And what's happening? And I think there are three main root causes to that. Um, one, the paw paws probably aren't getting enough sunlight, so they do need to get direct sunlight uh, for good fruit production. So chances are you have a canopy that's not providing the sunlight that they need. You'll usually see paw paws on the edge of woodland patches being really productive fruit, fruit but when you get into the interior, not so much. Um, another culprit, um, and this kind of goes back to Carrie's presentation on invasive species, um, pawpaws don't like competition and so if there's a lot of plant competition they really can't thrive and um, Professor Matt Davies at Ohio State has done a lot of work with his PhD students to clear out um, competitive plants in pawpaw patches and once that takes place you really see um, the pawpaws um, thriving. And then uh, the other root cause, it goes back to the idea of the root suckers. They're clones of themselves, and you really need cross-pollination from a genetically different plant. Um, and so that's probably one of the reasons why you're not getting fruit production if they're all root suckers from the same mother tree. Could you somehow transplant some of those from another place? You can, that? actually. and. Um, if you visit um, Paw Paw Chronicles, either um, the Facebook group or on um, the YouTube channel, 
they do a lot of transplanting of root suckers and they show you the methods of how you can successfully move them to other locations and they make great root stock um, because they already have a lot of what they need to thrive and then you can graft on top of those and you really get fast root production out of that. And the other thing, you know, just since I got your attention, is yeah. <laughs> since you're hand pollinating those things, uh -huh. you're doing that because there's the natural pollinators aren't doing it, but if I had these like 600, or, uh, 600 yards away, yeah. could they cross pollinate with some other? I mean, how far can you distance from to get cross pollination? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit more about okay. that on orchard settings. And so maybe we can, let's come that's back fine. to that question because yeah. I think when I show you the photo, it'll make more sense. Okay. But yeah, that's a great question. And I'm going to do a little bit more on that. Um, but pawpaw seeds, so they're dark brown, about the size of a lima bean, um, and like I was saying, um, a, a couple things about pawpaw seeds, uh, going back to the idea of um, the clonal communities, uh, there's, even though it takes about seven to eight years to get to fruit production from growing from seed, there are good reasons why you would want to, and that goes back to the idea if you have a woodland pawpaw patch that is mostly root suckers, if you throw some seeds in there, that introduces genetic diversity, and so that's an easy way to you know, create an edible food forest and to help with cross-pollination so that you do get the fruit production. Um, another good reason to grow from seed, um, you can create your own hardy root stock and start grafting on that. Um, what I will say though about pawpaw seeds is that there are a lot of sellers, particularly on Facebook Marketplace, that will claim that you will get a certain um, cultivar if you grow um, or purchase their seeds and that's actually false advertising. So pawpaw seeds aren't true to parents. Um, if you have two good parents, chances are you're going to get a good plant out of that. But I would just say buyer beware when you're purchasing seeds and you're, you know, your intention is to grow that for fruit production. Make sure you're buying from a really reputable seller. And uh, you can harvest uh, your fruit and save the seeds. Uh, there are only two rules that you need to remember. Don't freeze the seeds and don't let the seeds dry out. Uh, the seeds do need to go through a cold stratification process. And so what I do after I harvest the fruit is that I'll clean the seeds really well and put them in a freezer Ziploc baggie with um, moist but not wet sphagnum peat moss. And you need to keep them in the fridge at 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit for 90 to 120 days. And after that period, you can pull them out of the fridge and start germinating them. My kickoff day is usually Groundhog's Day, so that's when I start germinating my seeds. Uh, so pawpaw seeds can be finicky. Uh, I've had seeds germinate in as soon as 10 days, and I've had other pawpaw seeds that didn't germinate for 18 months. And so I would say, don't give up on your seeds. Um, but when you do plant them, I like to pre-germinate them, and so once I see that taproot emerge, that's when they get their own pot. Uh, you can plant them directly into the ground. Um, you want to plant them about one to two inches deep. Uh, the optimal pH for a pawpaw plant is 5.5 to 7.0, or you can plant them in a container and you want to use you know, high quality potting mix that has really good drainage. And in terms of pots, um, there are a couple of schools of thought on this. I think the traditional approach has been using tall tree pots that range anywhere from 12 to 14 inches tall. Uh, my thinking has changed over the last few years. Um, I've kind of switched to the Anderson band pots, and those uh, you can get for 9 to 10 inches tall, and that seems to be the sweet spot for pawpaws. Uh, I also know people who have had a lot of success using the root maker pots here on the far right, um, and I've been testing this out as well. And just like the name implies, the root maker pots really encourage the development of a really strong, healthy root mass. 
Uh, I think the downside for backyard growers is that you really have to purchase these pots by the case and the shipping can cost as much or more than the pots themselves. Uh, and so I've known a lot of growers who have successfully grown pawpaws using recycled milk cartons or one or two liter soda bottles um, and just making sure that you have really good drainage on the bottom. So saves a lot of uh, time and expense versus purchasing entire cases of pots. And so with pawpaws, you do need a lot of patience. So even if you pre-germinate your seeds, uh, it can take two or three months uh, just to see any leaves emerge. Um, and you know, with pawpaws, one thing that I see a lot of photos of online is that the seed coat um, can get stuck to the cotyledons. And that's kind of bad news bears for your pawpaw plants. And a little trick that I've learned that has worked really well for me over the last few years is to just put um, a layer of horticultural sand on top of the pawpaw plant. That seed coat's not going to come off if you don't plant it deep enough, and that seems to be the issue for most growers. But if you put that layer of sand, it kind of has to work that seed coat off, and that does the trick in my experience. And here you can see some pawpaw um, saplings that have been potted up in tall tree pots. And you can see that they're sitting on a plastic open crate down at the bottom there. Uh, pawpaws have long tap roots. And so uh, when you plant them, if that tap root emerges from the bottom of uh, the pot, those crates at the bottom encourage air pruning. And so what that does is it effectively burns off what's exposed to the air, and then um, it encourages the plant to produce more lateral branching and to become stronger and healthier. And here we have some older saplings. Uh, you could start grafting on trees when they're this size, when the diameter of um, the tree is about the same as a number two pencil, or you can plant them directly into the ground. Uh, so pawpaw trees, you know, kind of go through a little bit of transplant shock and it can be tricky. Um, but my number one um, recommendation is, you know, you kind of have to baby them your first year, but please make sure you put some kind of cage protection around the plant. I've had um, really sad stories about groundhogs and rabbits that have just bulldozed my pawpaw plants. And so, um, the cages take care of that issue, and then I've met many people at the festival um, whose pawpaw trees have been mowed down by other humans with weed whackers that kind of went rogue, and that cage will protect them against that too. And so going back to your question about, so this is the pawpaw orchard at OSU South Center's piped in. So in an orchard setting, the ideal spacing between trees uh, is 8 feet and then 18 feet between rows. I know some people say you can plant them as close as 6 feet. That's a little too close for comfort for my taste because you really want those lower branch develops and I, I just don't like them getting too crowded. 8 feet works. In my orchard, my trees are about 11 feet apart and that's good for pollination. I think anything beyond 50 15 feet gets a little tricky and then you might have to start doing your own hand pollination. Natural pollination should occur in that sweet spot between 8 to 15 feet. So the ones that are out in the wild, how do they get pollinated if they're just randomly scattered around? Uh, by luck? <laughs> well, you've got lots of flies and beetles working hard and they're attracted to the scent of the flowers. and. Um, there is the old wife's tale, which is actually proven to be true. Um, you've got some growers who put roadkill in their orchards to attract the flies and beetles. And I, I can't go that far. <laughs> but um, cottonseed meal works really well, actually. And that draws in pollinators and can help. Yeah. What was the distance between rows? Uh, 18 feet in this case, and that's what Kentucky State University recommends, and then um, 8 feet between trees. Mine are 11 by 11, but that will get a bobcat through safely without me you know, going wild. So, it, it, I mean, it depends on your space as well and what you're comfortable with. As long as you've got enough room um, to take care of weed management, 
You know, one of the key things to remember when your pawpaws are at this stage is making sure that they get enough water and also making sure that they have some kind of mulch protection against weed competition. And like I said, pawpaws just don't like that weed competition. I know a grower up in Michigan and you know some of his trees were struggling and once he put down a bunch of cardboard, he said the next year they just popped. And so it's just something to consider that doesn't get talked about a lot. That uh, mulch that they have down there, is that some kind of you know, textile fabric or is that what, what is that? Yeah, you know what, um, we could ask Logan Minter, um, he is overseeing the pawpaw orchard and I can get some more details. I know when this was established, I believe it's just like your standard landscape fabric, so that should work. So it's what water can get through? Exactly, water permeable, yeah. And they have a really nice system where they have drip irrigation. Um, if you're not able to do that, I use um, a bucket system where I just put a bucket that I drilled a 1 16th inch hole in, fill it up, and just let it drip over the course of several hours, and that's worked really great for me. And then here's a photo of a mature pawpaw orchard. Um, in direct sunlight, um, pawpaw trees can grow as tall as 20 to 40 feet high. But in an orchard setting, most growers will cut off the central leader at 6 to 10 feet. And a lot of that has to do with um, making fruit harvesting easier. And also, if you have fruit higher up in the tree, when that ripe fruit falls, there's a greater chance of it being damaged the longer it has to fall. Um, another best practice is I like to cut off or prune any limbs that are knee length or lower just for maintenance around the tree. And I like to keep the uh, lateral branches at about four feet long. Uh, beyond that, sometimes the weight of the fruit um, can really do some work on the branches. And I've seen um, limb breakage because of the weight of the fruit. So four feet is kind of that sweet spot. And in this photo, you can also see um, that the grower painted the tree trunks white. Let's wait for that to pop back up. There we go. Um, and that's because pawpaws are thin bark trees and they're very susceptible to um, sun scald or southwest injury. So there are organic um, whitewashes available out in the market, or you can use a 50-50 mix of water and white interior latex paint. You don't want to use exterior latex paint, and that works really well to help protect the tree and reduce any stress that it might have, especially during um, winter and peak summer. And so this is what uh, an example of what a fruit cluster would look like in the late May to June time period in central Ohio. Uh, don't be alarmed if you have these fruit clusters early in the spring season and they start falling off the tree. Uh, it's called June drop and it's a phenomenon that happens with apples and pears as well. And that's just the tree recognizing what it can or can't support um, during the growing season. And then this is what a fruit cluster would look like in the June to July time frame in central Ohio. And at this point, there are some benefits to thinning the cluster, especially if you have concerns about the weight load on certain branches. And in theory, if you thin the clusters, the tree would put more energy into, into developing you know, larger and juicier fruit. And there we go, that is the grand prize. That is a fully ripe cluster of pawpaw fruit. Um, it depends on what cultivar you have. Fruit can ripen as early as August, but in central Ohio, in my experience, it's anywhere from mid-September into early October. Um, you can tell that the fruit is ripe because as you approach a tree, it gives off this very, like, wonderful distinctive aroma. Some people find it very cloying, but I really enjoy it. And also when you give the fruit um, a gentle squeeze, it should have the same give as a ripe avocado or a ripe peach. In terms of market prices, I think the average going rate is about 8 to $12 per pound. Um, last year, Kentucky and Ohio got hit pretty hard by a late spring freeze. And um, 
there really wasn't a lot of fruit available in the market. And so at the Ohio Pawpaw Festival, fruit was going for $30 a pound. Um, yeah, and uh, unfortunately, I, you know, on Facebook yesterday, one of the big growers that I know in Kentucky, his trees were in full blossom and, you know, ready to be pollinated. And then last night, Kentucky got hit by that freeze. And so he's looking at a potential loss for a second year again. So that's, you know, a challenge that we've been facing that's new over the last few years. And so when you're thinking about cultivars, depending on your region, you might want to go for those cultivars that are um, later in the season, potentially. I know that up in Michigan and the Wisconsin area where I have friends, that's what they go for. Yeah. Are there any processes to mitigate frost? I mean, there are some things that, you know, uh, what you see um, apple growers or pear growers do, you can have the orchard, I think they're called stoves, mm -hmm. those are pricey, so that's kind of the downside. I've seen people use um, the tiki torches, um, but then that creates a fire hazard, so you'd have to keep a close eye on that. There are orchards um, that do spraying overnight if you are, have that system set up. So, I mean, there are some approaches that are available. Um, otherwise, most pawpaw growers, at least, um, are just letting Mother Nature do what she does. So, is that spraying, spraying water? Yeah. So, I mean, Carrie, help me out on this. It, like, protect the um, yeah. actual having the water protects the actual blossoms. Yeah, because liquid water is 32 degrees, so it's under free freezing. But it would, I mean, you, it's continuous watering yeah. until the chance of, of freeze is over. And so that can take a while and consume a lot of water. Yeah. And so that wraps up my presentation. All of the information that I provided for you today is available on my website. You can visit LibbyFarm.com. Please feel free to email me anytime. Um, I have a blog. Um, and I also have um, provided seed kits, uh, I have grafted trees and seedlings if that's something you might be interested in. And you can find me on social media on Facebook and Instagram. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions that you have in the time that we have left.